Praise God, he's given us his word to reveal to us the gospel, to tell us about how Christ has paid our debt in full and raised us up to new life, but he's given us the word of God also to then mature us in our faith, to guide us in the lives that we now live for his glory. And so we're going to take a look at Numbers 13 today, the life of Caleb. Our reading is from verses 17 to 33 of chapter 13. Follow along with me. Hear the word of the Lord. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negev and go up into the hill country. I should say right before this passage, the 12 spies had been, uh, had been uh, identified, called out from the 12 tribes, and among them were Joshua and Caleb. And now Moses is telling us about what happened when they went up to spy out the land. So notice they went into the Negev, up into the hill country, and they were told to see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, and whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities that they dwell in are camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are trees in it or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and they spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rahob near Lebo Hamath. They went up into the Negev and came to Hebron. Ahiman, Sheshai, Talmai, the descendants of Anak were there. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came to the valley of Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes. And they carried it on a pole between two of them. They also brought some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the valley of Eshkol because the cluster that the people of Israel had cut down from there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, We came into the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, The people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there, the Amalekites, dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land which we have gone to spy out, to to spy it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. So we seemed to them. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you that even as we read these historical accounts from thousands of years ago, there is truth here for us today that is very relevant for our own lives. There are lessons here. Would you help Pete now, Lord, to show us what we are to take from this text, that we might be people of faith, that we might be people who know our God and who live before him in a way that would please him. 
We thank you, Lord, for your patience with us. We pray that your word would continue its work in our lives to conform us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so help us to concentrate now. Help us to give our attention to it. And may you be pleased to use it in our lives for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. My welcome to those who are new with us this morning. I see Faith and uh, and uh, Legend down there, and we met with Peter and Marge. Lovely to have you with us. Thank you so much. And of course, our friends <coughs> up in the village and online. I love that someone else does the reading uh, because it means I don't have to deal with all those very very hard names and place names. So I get tongue tied at the best of times. So thank you, Wayne. Thank you so much, worship team. I felt we had a a nice time of worship this morning. So our second message in this series, a little series that we're doing on on some folk in in God's Word, and we're, we're looking at how they have interacted with God, how they've journeyed. And we look at their character traits, and we see how God uses them despite their shortcomings. I didn't want to look at uh, really great people because none of us really can aspire to some of those things. But we all know our foibles, we all know our shortcomings, so we find someone in the Word of God who struggles a little bit and we can go, ah, I, I resonate with that. So as we begin our second character study from God's Word, we might be struck this morning with, I guess, the difference, though, between the two men. Last week, we looked at Gideon, a cowering fellow who, uh, under uh, enormous strain, was, was beating out his, his wheat in a wine press, hidden away. This week, our study, as you heard, will focus on Caleb, and the contrast is astounding. So let me set the scene for you. The first time we meet Caleb, the the people of Israel are encamped at Kadesh Barnea. I think we've got a map up there. Nope. Okay, something's happening. That's all right. Yay. Kadesh Barnea. So, and um, this was an an oasis in, in the Negev Desert, south of the Promised Land. Now, it's only been two short years since they've come out of Egypt. These now freed Israelites. As you can imagine, two years walking in the desert, and we've read the account. All the incredible things, the miracles that they would have seen in that two-year journey. The Red Sea opening, water gushing from a rock, the manna. They fought the Amalekite raiders and won, and Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, destroyed the golden calf. The Israelites have ratified the covenant with God, and they've built the tabernacle and constructed the Ark of the Covenant. All these things they've done in that two short years. So you might say that the essentials of their nationhood under God uh, as their king have been established. And now it's time to enter in to this promised land. At that time, Caleb, he's about 40. He's about 40 years of age and he's recognized as a leader of his tribe, the tribe of Judah, one of the largest in the 12, of the 12 tribes And the Lord gave Moses this directive. Numbers 13, verse 2. Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone, a chief among them. 
And so in chapter 13, we have a long list of men whom Moses has chosen. Now, these men were chosen because of their leadership qualities, their courage. They would have been men who uh, would have had the respect and allegiance of the people of their tribe. These men were the movers and shakers of Israel. Numbers 13, 17 to 18 says, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up into the Negev and up into the hill country and see what the land is. And whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they be few or many. And as we read on, there's a list of things that Moses asks them to assess. Of course, many of us who maybe went to school, Sunday school as children, we, we know the story, don't we, of, of Caleb and, and, his, uh, and his mates that went out. And they came back with that huge pole with an enormous a bunch of grapes. Of course, it's you know, this big when you're a child. It was probably only that big. But it was a big bunch of grapes and, 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 and beautiful fruit, pomegranates and figs. It was a testament to the goodness of the land. We aren't given a lot of detail as to their journey, except it took 40 days and they spied out the entire land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehob near Labo Hamath. And after the 40 days, they presented their report to Moses and as we read, to the entire congregation. Notice God didn't just say, just peek over the border and have a look. Just see if it looks okay. No, he said, go throughout the entire land. He wanted them to see the entirety of the blessing they were being asked to take One end to the other. No surprises there. Now, this is the part of the story, however, where we find things begin to go a little bit haywire. You see, the report that they bring is actually an accurate report. It's interesting to note here the reference back to Exodus chapter 3, where the Lord himself said to Moses at the burning bush in the wilderness, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. Listen, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Clearly, this word of the Lord had been related to Moses. A big pardon, by Moses to the Israelites to encourage them from the beginning. And, and so in the first part of their report, these spies actually agreed with the Lord's, Lord's description. This is indeed a land flowing with milk and honey. And they had the produce to prove it. It's not until we get to verse 30, though, that we see the cracks starting to, uh, d- to appear. Uh, as Caleb confidently asserts in Numbers 13, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy the land, for we are well able to overcome it. But then, of course, the ten others who went up with Caleb and Joshua were having no part of this plan. They must have thought that Caleb and Joshua were off their good. Often people who live a life of overt faithfulness are considered a little bit left field. Sometimes playing off the planet, by a society of, with no knowledge of or appreciation for the things of God. And sometimes even from people from within the church. The retort from the ten other spies then was, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And then they go on to say that the land would devour them and that the land's full of giants, the Nephilim, from whom the sons of Anak came. Now, right now we need to be asking the question, how is it? How is it possible 
That different people can witness the same event and yet have such totally different responses to it. I think the next statement we read from the ten faithless men goes a long way towards answering that question. Listen to what they said, Numbers 13, 33. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who came from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. You see, the problem was not how they perceived the inhabitants of the land, but rather how they perceived themselves. We seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. Caleb and the other spies had seen the same land and the people on their journey and that God had been true and honest and faithful to his word. You know, I think we need to always be careful not to measure ourselves against other people and their accomplishments or other people and their failures. Both will give us a false identity, a false sense of our own worth and value. Well, indeed, the land did flow with milk and honey, just like Moses had was told. That being the case, why did they not trust God with the rest of his decree to the Israelites? Verse 2, that is that they spy out the land, listen, which I am giving to the people of Israel. They believed the first bit. Yes, it was flowing with milk and honey. Why could they not believe the second bit? Was God not able? He says, I'm giving them the land. God told them of the fullness of the land and also that they would be the possessors of it. Why? Because God had said so. It reminds me of a saying we used to bandy about. God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. We scratch our heads, don't we, and wonder how, after seeing all that God had done, and in such a publicly manifest way, from bringing them out of Egypt so miraculously, to all the supernatural provision in the desert. How, how, how? Could they doubt God's word? In verse 32, we read a damning indictment upon the, the faithless ten, where they're described as, as having brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land. But the report wasn't bad because they described all that was in that land. It was bad, or if you like, an, an evil report, because they did not describe it in faith or align it with God's Word. On the other hand, Caleb and Joshua, who were men who knew God and trusted Him to bring His Word to pass, tried to persuade the gathered Israelites with their faith. They said, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. And if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear. Notice this incredibly positive attitude. Notice the explicit mention of Yahweh in there. The ten spies didn't even mention God, only what they had seen that terrified them. I think, too, that it's important to recognize that this isn't just the power of positive thinking. We can do it. Nor was this Caleb declaring or decreeing into the situation. He simply spoke simple, faithful words which agreed with and aligned with God's own word. 
But that day, fear prevailed. Or perhaps, better said, faithlessness prevailed. Because faith can never thrive in the presence of fear. (laughs) Fear can never thrive in the presence of faith. They're incompatible, oil and water. Without a people united in faith behind Moses, any enterprise was doomed to fail. The unbelief which had spread throughout the camp resulted in disunity and rebellion as fear and unbelief always does. We do well to remember Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. It says, without faith it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. The Lord was angry with the people and vowed that none of their generation would enter into the promised land except for two, Caleb and Joshua, men who believed, men who had faith, men who didn't doubt God's word. Faithlessness is a destructive and all-consuming sin. Do you know that faithlessness has very real consequences in our lives, both in your own life and in the lives of those around you? Faithlessness and negativity and pessimism. You know, they're more contagious than any COVID virus. And they will destroy all that we have quicker than any bushfire. That's what happened here. A bad report put fear into the hearts of the Israelites. How? If in your situation fear and failure is the thing you look at most and fail to see in the light of God's word, then your issue becomes bigger than God. If you were to stand three feet back from an... Have you ever seen those um, aircraft carriers, big battleship things? Now and again, you you see them on the news and so forth. If you were to stand only three feet back from one, let me tell you, you would not be able to see one end from the other. That's how big they are. Enormous. But back yourself up a a kilometre. Or make it two. And you know what? I could stand there and hold that battleship in my hand, like that. You see, it's all about perception. The ship didn't shrink. Only how we perceive it. G.K. Chesterton, an insightful author, wrote this. He said, The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. left untried because God seemed too small in comparison to the difficulties of life. We all can and do go through times of uncertainty, don't we? That's the reality of life. We all struggle from time to time with not knowing how a thing will turn out. But it's in those times that we need to draw even closer to God, to prioritise time with God. In his word, times of intimacy and prayer. That's why our walk is a walk of faith, with faith being the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. God himself affirmed this to Joshua when he was commissioned for service. Many of you will remember reading, of course, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 where God said to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, being careful to observe all that's written in it. And then you'll have good success and then you'll prosper in all your ways. My rendition. Joshua 1.8 Hmm. Lost my way. As we seek out God, 
And as we value him in these times, we're able to either we're able to either see the pathway clearer ahead, or if not, to trust him anyway. To trust him regardless with our next step. When God is big in our lives and we have a healthy diet of his word, we will never be like grasshoppers in our own sight because that's not what God says about us. Joshua and Caleb have seen some giants and they've seen the heavily fortified cities. But they're not understanding the scene before them or interpreting their ability to take the land from a natural perspective. Rather, their perception is formed and understood through God's word of comforting and powerful assurance. He said this, God said to them, I am with you. I am with you. Looking through the lenses of faith, they see the Lord enabling them to conquer these people. Caleb does not see himself as a puny grasshopper to be squashed under the foot of a giant. Why? Because he isn't serving a puny God. One of the most telling descriptions of Caleb, and the one we do well to emulate, is the one that's repeated six times in that passage He says, the Lord said himself, he hath fully followed the Lord. What a great commendation from the Lord himself. Wouldn't you like to have that as your epitaph on your tombstone? He, she has fully followed the Lord. Well, after trying to encourage the Israelites, chapter 14, verses 7 to 9, to trust God, the angry, frightened, rebellious crowd were going to stone Caleb and Joshua, but God intervened. And we read in verse 10 that the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. Everyone there saw the manifest glory of God and yet remained rebellious. God then goes on and pronounces judgment upon the entire generation of adults who came out of Egypt, telling them that because of their unbelief, they would not receive the blessing on the land, of the land as an inheritance. At least that is all but the two. The two faithful men, Caleb and Joshua, these two alone would inherit the promised land land along with all those under 20 years of age at the time of the rebellion rebellion numbers 14 22 to 24 says this none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that i did in egypt and in the wilderness yet have put me to the test these 10 times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that i swore to give their fathers And none of those who despised me shall see it, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully. I will bring him into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. Who is it that possesses the blessings of God, but the righteous, the faithful, the believing, Not the rebellious, unbelieving, unrighteous ones. They have no part in God's glory, no part in God's provision. We need to be a people of a different spirit. We need to be a people of faith, of trust, a people of obedience towards their God. We have to grasp the truth of who God is and that he is a sovereign God over all things, wholly trustworthy, all-powerful. Only then will we see and live differently. We can't become a, a people who react out of fear and uncertainty. Or we're going to become at the mercy of the circumstances of life. We're going to be tossed to and fro, but 
Rather, we have an opportunity to show an uncertain world. Caught up in despair and confusion, that faith in God is the key to successful, blessed, peace-filled living. And remember, without faith, no man, no woman shall see God. May God help us and, and strengthen us this week to see life with his eyes and to trust him more. Let's pray together. Loving God and Father, we want to acknowledge this morning our, our great need of you. Father, we want to acknowledge that before you we stand as, a, as wretched, sinful, broken and frail humanity. We recognize, Father God, that salvation can come only through the blood of the Lamb. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Help us to be a people who will believe your word, who will live our lives out in the light of your word and your promises to us. Standing on the promises of God. Father, bless the rest of our day. Bless your word to our hearts. And Lord, as we come to just worship you again, would you work in and through us by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.